Okay, let's start the presentation. This is presentation two of a seven part Zoom series. And this is Allies, Assets and Actions in the Community. And I am Jan Spencer and I am in Eugene, Oregon right now. So let me just share a few of the ideals of the seven part series. It's to encourage picking up the pace for social, political, and economic transformation towards a society that lives within the boundaries of the natural world and brings out the best and positive human potential. An economic system that's honest, accountable, and serves the healthy goals of society. And of course, restoration of the natural world. These are just kind of my ideals right there. And the contents for this evening's presentation, I'll have a, a few words, a point of departure, which will give you a little more idea uh, where I'm at. And, uh, and that will include what might an ideal society be like. I'll say a few things, uh, the most of the presentation, allies, assets, and actions in the community. This will be a, very interesting collection of um, making use of city programs, making use of urban infrastructure, rooftops, parking lots, money, time, all kinds of examples of uh, putting assets into action, putting allies, combining allies, assets, and actions. Uh, it's a great topic. And then after that, we'll do a little question and answer and some comments. And uh, I'll want to do a preview of the next five presentations. That'll just take a few minutes. And then what I'd like to do after that is stop the screen share so that everybody can see each other and, uh, and have a bit of a conversation with people who want to continue with the evening. This takes about an hour to get to this point because I'm very interested to hear from people what kinds of allies, assets, and action stories you have where you live because that's a, that's a great topic. It's wonderful when we know more what other people are doing where they live in terms of uh, system change in terms of the paradigm shift. That's what we're interested in here. So I'll mention also all the presentations will migrate to YouTube. You can take a screenshot of anything you like. So let's move on to the next, the next slide. Points of departure. These are just some, give you a little bit of an idea of my worldview here. I think we live in one of history's most remarkable examples of social engineering and is commonly referred to as the consumer culture. We grew up with it. We think it's normal. It doesn't have to be. This is just a, a, a product of the economic system. Our entire culture is a product of the economic system. It's created so people will buy stuff. Perhaps the most important product of market capitalism is the success that it's had in degrading society's capacity to imagine and create social, economic, and political alternatives. Well, that's what here, we're here for right now is to talk about creating alternatives. And I bet uh, people here have some good stories to share too. And each front yard garden worker co-op voluntarily downsized lifestyle, and many, many other actions point the way towards a preferred future. So let's try to be a, a little bit on the same page here. What are allies, assets, and actions? In terms of this presentation, I think of allies as being people. They can be organizations. They can be movements that have potential for making common cause. Assets, 
ideas, principles, tools, physical structures that have potential for positive results, putting these assets into action. And of course, actions bringing allies and assets together for creating positive outcomes. Pretty straightforward. And here is a little graphic. I like making graphics. And it's kind of a circular graphic. And the take home message here is that when allies recognize assets, they can create actions. And that leads to more assets, new allies, and new actions. So this is a, a proverbial positive resource of uh, a positive a loop of benefits with allies, assets, and actions. Okay, well, here's an awesome, uh, very important asset that we have, and that's permaculture. I am thinking a lot of people know what permaculture is. I'm not going to go into a great deal of explanation about permaculture, but uh, permaculture can be applied at almost any scale to almost any purpose. It could be a backyard garden. It could be a bioregional economic system, permaculture, uh, holistic, and designing for multiple benefits is a wonderful tool for helping to bring about paradigm shift. Here's a picture from Eugene. This is not my neighborhood, but it's uh, about two miles away, friendly neighborhood here in Eugene. The short story here is that people in the neighborhood recognized some public property. It was a street right of way that didn't have a street on it. This is, of course, you can see in a suburban neighborhood, there was just never a street built here. So some people in the neighborhood approached the city and said, we'd like to put a garden in here because this is a great location. We're willing to do the work. The city was cooperative. The city told them, you have to do this, you have to do that. And the, the group in the neighborhood satisfied all those requirements. So one picture here shows the actual breaking ground and putting in the garden. And the picture below is a, a good number of years later. It's not a garden where you have your plot and somebody else has their plot. It's everybody all together. This is just a wonderful amenity to friendly neighborhood. And I know people who have moved to the neighborhood because of this garden, because it's just such an attractive feature to have in the, in the neighborhood. It's created a lot of positive, eco-friendly culture in friendly neighborhood. This picture here, also in Eugene, is the uh, a store it's a organic home scale garden store they sell whatever uh, a home gardener is going to be interested in they have chickens and uh and plant sets uh, a local fellow who uh, installs rainwater systems has a display these are kind of old pictures right here it looks a lot more robust now but the short story is somebody had an idea or imagination is an asset and they had the initiative to move into action and create a healthy business and and i buy things here at the store as well so it's just a good a good example of imagination as as a very important asset. And this is a whole other kind of an asset, the wisdom of the world's great spiritual traditions. I'm not talking about religion here. This is the spiritual traditions, the social code that virtually regardless of period of history, of geography, of language, the world's great spiritual traditions have a lot in common if you read their texts. And those items I find most compelling that are in common are care for the natural world and modesty of lifestyle, service to the community, personal and society uplift and responsibility for our own actions. 
if I was to desi uh, design a, a society, I would use something like this for designing a society. These are, are wonderful ideals right here. These are assets and these can be the, uh, the catalyst for all kinds of uh, recognizing allies and uh, creating actions. This wisdom of the world's great spiritual traditions. A suburban neighborhood can be a tremendous asset. This particular picture I showed last week and last week's presentation, it's my neighborhood. And you can see that the purple rectangles, those are all permaculture friendly properties. Doesn't mean everybody's got full on complete permaculture, but a lot of these properties do have a lot of permaculture. Uh, Joshua, who is looking after the chat and the technical help for this presentation, this is Joshua's place down here. This is my place up here. So there's enormous potential in suburbia, uh, especially where we live here. This is a pretty benign kind of suburbia, but almost any suburbia has got access to the sun, uh, access to rainwater, some soil, Certainly, there are lots of different kinds of climates. Not all suburbia is created equal, but there's enormous social uh, and economic potentials for developing, redeveloping, reimagining what suburbia can be. And speaking of suburbia, here's a little chunk of suburbia. This is actually uh, my house right here. And what this slide is about is repurposing a driveway. I had space for five cars to park on my driveway. It's a, it's a modest house, it's a quarter acre property, but I can do better with that property, with that uh, driveway than leaving it like that. I do have a vehicle, I park it out on the street. I don't use it very much, but I put this driveway into much better use I have food growing up above where the driveway was. I have a shed. I planted an English walnut tree. So the next time you see a driveway, think about, wow, that could be something a lot more productive, uh, especially if we had a lot less cars that used all these driveways. But uh, removing a driveway and putting it to better use is one of the best things I've done here on my own suburban property. This slide is from the Global Footprint Network, and it's the, the homepage you come to when you are looking for the ecological footprint. This is an enormous educational asset right here, and it can lead to all kinds of actions. What you do, if you're not familiar with this, is you, uh, you take a survey. This is the entry to a survey where you would be asked different questions about your lifestyle, what kind of food, what kind of place you live, your transportation, what are your spending habits, and you answer these questions. And after you answer these questions, then the calculator tells you how many planet Earths it would take for everybody on planet Earth to live like you. Very interesting. I know people who are totally progressive, completely progressive, all the good attitudes, who have totally middle class ecological footprints. The, the approximate idea is for everybody on planet Earth to live like the average American, we would need something like five planet Earths. And this is, of course, the consumer culture right here. We grew up with this. We think it's normal. It's what we're used to. But uh, this also uh, delivers us to climate change and a lot uh, of other issues that we're dealing with. So the footprint calculator is a wonderful, a, a wonderful, powerful, even can give you a little bit of a jolt, kind of an educational resource. You could look at this picture and say, well, you know, that's a nice looking garden. 
and uh, with some solar voltaics right there out in the garden. Well, it's, it is a nice garden, but it's a rooftop also. This is a flat rooftop. Uh, Marisha Auerbach in Portland uh, put her rooftop to work. Wow, this is amazing, of course, not to mention the rest of the, of the property, but uh, there is increasing interest in uh, putting gardens on rooftops. They had to reinforce the interior walls to support the weight of the garden. They just didn't start dumping loads of dirt up here. Uh, they, they put like, I think it was five, five eighth inch plywood on all the interior walls to make uh, that vertical support strong enough to support this weight up here. And of course, there's a bunny that lives up here in the summertime. Another asset, I'm very much into urban land use. And I've done a lot of reading and snooping around on the internet. And I, I found some time ago that New York City has what they call the uh, uh, public plaza program. And what that allows is for people in the different boroughs of New York City to identify places, uh, public spaces in the different boroughs that fit certain qualifications. And if there's uh, if there's certain qualifications are fulfilled, you've got to have community input, uh, support. You have to have people who uh, commit to managing this, all these different types of requirements. But what the potential is, is to turn a space like this right here, just this little commercial street right here, which isn't really being used very well. There's a park over here, actually, and you can even see right here, there's a, the subway. Well, at this point, the subway is not underground. It's right here. But the people who lived in this neighborhood petitioned the city to turn this into a, a plaza, and that's what happened. So this is what that space became. Uh, I'm not positive if this became totally permanent, I'm not sure what the update is for this program, but there are many, many dozens of public pl plazas in New York City, and they probably have different designations in terms of longevity. Are they permanent? Are they six months? But just imagine turning this, just cars parked, and, uh, uh, and nobody would really feel like hanging out in this in this street right here, and then look what it turned out. Uh, this is uh, another presentation I'm going to do in a uh, a couple weeks is pushing back on cars, and I'll have lots of examples of pushing back on cars, reclaiming uh, car space, and uh, repurposing that for people. And this is one of those pictures. I have lots more too. So this is a good, a good example. Another wonderful asset is neighborhood associations. Here in Eugene, the city has a neighborhood program and my neighborhood has a neighborhood association. I'm actually on the board. Joshua's on the board. We're both on the board of the River Road Community Organization. So a neighborhood association has the capacity to put information out to the neighborhood. And whoever is involved with the organization helps create the agenda. And it's a wonderful opportunity to learn civics. This is kind of the base of the, the community civic pyramid. And uh, our organization over the years has put out all kinds of permaculture information. We've had programs. We've been involved with events. We've put out newsletters to every address in the neighborhood about permaculture. Any neighborhood has lots of different sorts of issues. And uh, the people, again, who are involved on the board, go to the meetings, participate, they can help make the agenda. And if the neighborhood association is interested in paradigm shift, then that can become part of the agenda right there. Neighborhood associations are, are wonderful assets. 
This is a, an action in Olympia, Washington, speaking of neighborhood associations. I've been to this place. And the story here is, it's a suburban neighborhood and one of the city streets was never put in. It was all overgrown, there were trees, uh, there was construction debris. It wasn't a really unhealthy place. It wasn't like trash and garbage, but there was a lot of refuse and you couldn't really walk through there. Probably actually a fairly good little bit of habitat, but somebody had the idea that why don't we have a pathway that goes along that right of way for connecting one street to another so that the kids in the nearby elementary school don't have to walk a lot of blocks to go around one of these uh, 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 neighborhood uh, residential blocks. They can have a much shorter route to go home from their elementary school. So Northeast neighbors went to the city of Olympia and they pitched the idea and there was a lot of back and forth. It didn't happen immediately, of course, but eventually it did. So um, that was the beginning of the neighborhood pathway program in Olympia. I don't know what is current with this program, but uh, the city does have a process that would help manage neighbor ideas for doing these kind of pathways in other parts of Olympia. I don't know what's the current update with that program, but this is a great way. You can imagine all the work and the effort to make this a, uh, a nice pathway. And of course, what makes this pathway even better is uh, my friend here, Pat Rasmussen, she designed a food forest. It's an edible shortcut there in Olympia. So that's a great story. A uh, wonderful asset, unused public property. Green capital accumulation. Our own money, of course, is an enormous asset. What do we do with our money? And of course, um, money can do all kinds of, can spend money in all sorts of ways. And the message of this slide right here is that we can use our money, whether it's a lot or it's not so much in productive ways. How we spend our money, of course, is has enormous consequences on our own lifestyles and on the well-being of the natural world, on politics, on economics, uh, the quality of life. So the message here with this slide is that if we have priorities with our time and with our money, we can direct those resources, those assets that we have in a positive way to help bring about the kind of world most of us would prefer to see. And this is just an, an extremely short list. You can imagine dozens of other organizations to add to this list. These are just a few that I, I wrote down in a very short time. But when you consider that almost any community organization exists to benefit the community and somehow uh, it could be a social issue, it could be an environmental issue, uh, could be even political, but almost any organization exists to improve the well-being of the community. And because of that fact, essentially, all these organizations are on the same team and they could be more productively working with each other. And I'm gonna go into a lot more detail on this topic in the final presentation, presentation number seven. That's in uh, almost two months. I think that's December 3rd. But the idea of what if economic and political democracy became the rallying cry of a, a mass movement of organizations that essentially are interested in those issues, but what if they recognized other organizations were also interested and somehow came upon a way to synchronize with each other for what I like to call 
a new movement that already exists because there's interest in all these different ways to make our society better. But if those organizations making the society better, more collaborated and synchronized with each other, then they could be much more powerful. And uh, certainly there are other people who realize that too. But I'm, uh, I'm going to go into more detail in a presentation. Uh, that's December 3rd into this particular idea of economic and political democracy. So this right here is uh, about, a, about a mile from where I live. This is in Eugene. It's a, a church, a faith community, and it's a suburban church, and they just happen to have a couple acres of land. And what they've done with this land is they have a big market garden on part of it. They still got room for more garden, but this isn't a backyard garden. This is a garden. This is a professional garden and they have a farm stand as well. So the short story here is not every church or synagogue or temple has a couple acres of property, but some of them do. And, uh, that is a potential resource that is an asset for creating local food. And actually, there's another church that's closer to me than this that just recently put in a nice size garden as well. So in a broader sense, faith communities have an enormous role to play in the overall topic, the overall movement towards creating a, a healthy, and uh, sustainable culture and society. This picture here, as I mentioned, Joshua, myself, and others are involved with our neighborhood program. And what this picture shows here is that the city organized a process to solicit neighborhood input on creating more of a neighborhood plan. How would we like our neighborhood to evolve for the next 20 or 30 years? And the city created all these different opportunities to gather input from the people who lived in uh, our neighborhood and our next door neighborhood, Santa Clara. So what a lot of us did is this is a great opportunity to try to get permaculture and pro uh, uh, progressive ideas into this document. And a lot of uh, what we want to put in the document is in the documents. Uh, what that eventually leads to remains to be seen. Uh, I don't think anybody is uh, anticipating that our efforts are gonna lead directly to Ecotopia, but we are making use of uh, this public process, which drew uh, 50, 100, hundreds of people. You can see uh, this image down here. There were like 400 people that, uh, that evening. These are, they're all working on maps and they're all coming up with ideas. It was a great process. Uh, but to make use of this opportunity, not only to try to influence the city, but also to bring these good ideas about healthy living to lots of other people who attended these meetings too. So this was a great asset. That looks pretty good to me. I actually prepared that. I had that for dinner one night. But of course, food choices are an, an enormous asset. Uh, they can be a wonderful way to reduce our eco footprints. Of course, I'm vegetarian and uh, I'm not going to do too much advocating for a vegan or vegetarian diet at this point right here, but diet choices are an enormous asset in terms of uh, how we consume, how we take care of our needs in ways that have less of an impact on planet Earth. Food choices are a big deal. This image from Medford, Oregon. Medford is in Southern Oregon. It's not one of the progressive hotspots of Oregon, but when I found out about this uh, gospel garden when I was down that way a few years ago, I said, this is great. 
all kinds of community organizations came together to turn a parking lot. You can see this is a parking lot. There were cars here to turn a parking lot into a big raised bed garden. And all kinds of organizations helped out with this. I read the, a bit online about this and it was the Chamber of Commerce and the Kiwanis Club, all kinds of totally mainstream organizations are all allies for creating this community garden. And the location is actually, you can see down here, this is where uh, homeless people, hungry people can come and have a meal. So that's a pretty important community service. And of course, at certain times of the year, some of what they prepare in here is coming from the garden. So there's just multiple benefits that result from this particular action right here. This picture here shows what looks like a pretty nice contemporary looking living space. Well, this is what that living space looked like at one time. It was a, a one car garage. This was my garage. One of the first things I did when I moved into this house was turn the, the garage into a living space to make my place a three bedroom house instead of a two bedroom house. Lots of people convert garages into living space that can increase the residential density of a property, which means we don't have to expand so far out. Residential density, more people living in a modest space helps protect farmland and helps make uh, community services like public transportation more viable. Suburbia is known for being spread out and uh, doing this kind of retrofit to suburbia could help densify and there's lots of benefits for turning a garage into a, a living space. Our 42nd Avenue in Portland is an economic development agency. Uh, it does receive some public funding and what our 42nd Avenue does is it works with the people who live in the neighborhood, with the property owners, with the business owners. This is a small area. This is only, uh, I think, maybe six or eight blocks on 42nd Avenue in the Cully neighborhood in Portland. And the, the goal here is to redevelop this stretch of 42nd Avenue and make it more vibrant and make it a place that better serves the needs of the neighborhood. This isn't a really depressed area, but there are empty buildings and it's not a wealthy part of town. But our 42nd Avenue, which does have a website, you can check out their website. Uh, they uh, do planning, uh, they have services. This image right here, this is a business incubator, uh, a fellow who, uh, who is responsible for this little store. I don't think that's him. This is my friend right here. But our 42nd Avenue provides him with some space to try to get his business off the ground. And what he has here is a home and garden small business to serve people in the neighborhood. Uh, you see tools here and there'd be some fertilizer here, probably seeds, the different kinds of, of items that a home gardener would want to have. So our 42nd Avenue is helping him get his business off the ground because this business fits the character of the neighborhood. The whole idea is that the redevelopment fits the character. It serves the people in the neighborhood. That's a pretty good mission statement here. There's a big farmer's market across the street. Uh, this is an empty building that uh, I haven't been there for a couple of years, but the idea was to turn this into kind of a, a, a small mall where different small scale merchants can have a space, you know, for selling uh, products and services that would be helpful for the neighborhood. So this is just a great, a great idea, a uh, economic development. There are others too. This is by no means unique, but this is a good example of small scale economic development 
being a real ally and asset to the community. This picture here, I happen to know a couple people in this picture. This is a natural food wholesaler here in Eugene. And once again, somebody had the idea of creating a natural foods wholesale business. And they started out kind of small and they got kind of bigger and they got kind of bigger. I don't know how large this is gonna grow, but this mostly serves the Western Oregon area. This is of course all organic natural foods. They try to source uh, what product they can from local farmers. Um, I'm part of a buying club and, and this is where we buy our, uh, our bulk food from Hummingbird Wholesale. But it's a good example of a good place to work and people who had an idea and took the initiative built a, uh, a very viable and important and useful business. And I'd mention also that uh, they're helping to pay a little bit of the Zoom bill for, uh, for this presentation right here. So they're community minded and it looks like they have some pretty happy employees right there. This image here is again, my neighborhood. Uh, my house would be uh, somewhere, somewhere in here, somewhere is kind of covered up. But the important feature here is this is the Willamette River. That's the Eastern margin of our neighborhood. And this is all greenway, it's all public property along the, the river here. There's a bike path along here. That's how I go into town is there's a bike path. Um, there's habitat. Occasionally you'll see a bald eagle. There's lots of osprey. Uh, it is by no means a virgin wilderness over there. But this is a wonderful asset that we have here in my neighborhood. And different people in the neighborhood have essentially adopted parts of the Greenway. I have a, a written signed agreement with the city of Eugene to look after the Filbert Grove. And that means I am committed to doing a certain number of work parties and, and putting in a certain number of hours to create, uh, improve the well being of the Filbert Grove. And it's kind of up to me to decide exactly what I do. There's nobody looking over my shoulder. Razor Park, another friend is looking, uh, looks after Razor Park. We've had lots of work parties in Razor Park for uh, restoring habitat for uh, native plants. And these other areas along the, the Greenway, other people uh, have agreements with the city to look after those. So the story here is that people in the neighborhood are taking initiative to look after an enormous asset in our neighborhood. And the longer term goal is to improve the, the, the quality of habitat along here because it's definitely not a virgin wilderness. There's lots of blackberry in here. There's invasive species. There's lots of work to be done. But we uh, have been working with the city for about a decade. And this is an asset that we're aware we could attract a lot of people who live in the neighborhood to help out with this. And of course, we've had lots of work parties, but the potential for making use of this asset to create new allies by having actions, by having work parties in the Greenway could really do a lot to build community here in our neighborhood. That's why I have this picture here. This is another scene from my neighborhood. We have bike tours here in my neighborhood. Recall that one image that showed the fuchsia colored rectangles. And I said, these are different permaculture properties. We probably have a couple dozen properties within a five or eight minute bike ride of my house that are worthy of being on a site tour. So this is a big asset that we're building here in our neighborhood. And that is, we can have show and tells of what people are doing here in the neighborhood to make their properties more productive in terms of food, water, aesthetics, energy. So what we see here 
as just one particular bike tour. We met at the, the park down the street, and uh, this is next door to me right here, and this is around the block, uh, a few a couple blocks away. This is another backyard right here. So this kind of goes along with the idea that suburbia can be a wonderful asset. And when we start repairing suburbia, we can show and tell how we're repairing suburbia. And when people see what other people are doing, it makes them more likely to take on that kind of an idea and put it to use for them as well. Just a, a little bit of a note right here. Uh, we probably have about another 12 or 15 slides because I want to make this about an hour and we've been, we've been looking at slides for oh, about 35 or 40 minutes. So just have that in mind. We've got a number of more really, really great pictures. So this is block planning. Block planning is a approach to redeveloping a block. The city of Eugene recognizes block planning. Nobody's actually ever really done this in Eugene. Several groups tried to years ago, but it never quite got off the ground. But it remains, a, it's a better idea than ever. So if you look at these two, these two blocks, this of course is the before and this is the after right here. And I've color coded these red objects here. Those just give you an orientation. Those are the same places, both before and after. The green is greenery that didn't exist over here. That could be gardens, that could be uh, fruit trees, edible landscaping. The blue are new structures. One of the key aspects of this particular idealized image, this image hasn't actually happened somewhere, but it could. But one of the key aspects of this is, is trading automobile space for human space, for gardens, for other use. In this idealized image, people have agreed they'll park at the end of the block. This would be a, uh, a way for emergency vehicles to go through here. But just in this idealized image, and there are millions of blocks in the United States that can do something like this. But the key is that the people who live on the block, the property owners, the city, the neighborhood association, all come together to make a block plan. And when you have a block plan, city regulations become a lot more flexible. The regulations don't go away, but the city will say, show us how you're gonna do this. It's performance compliance rather than prescriptive compliance. Usually the city says, this is what you're gonna do. But in block planning, the city says, this is the result we want, show us how you're gonna do it. So that means there's a lot more flexibility. I wish I could say this was happening all over the place here, it's not. It's just kind of something that a lot of people don't know about and you can imagine it would take an enormous amount of effort to put something like this together. But the, the movement of history, the trends, the environmental, social, economic, political trends are moving in a direction where this kind of redevelopment is going to be a lot more attractive. You can imagine all the jobs this would create by, uh, by doing all this uh, rebuilding, reworking this property, this would create a lot of jobs. Reimagining, repurposing the urban landscape could be one of the big growth industries, one of the big employment industries of the paradigm shift. There's lots of work to do. This image here, you can look online and Look up City Repair, Portland, Oregon. City Repair is a nonprofit in Portland and it does some of the most right on work I know about. It is, wrote the book essentially on placemaking and placemaking is a term that refers to taking a place, a location in a neighborhood and doing something special with it. Something could be artistic, 
could be for fun, uh, could be informational like this kiosk. This is a little play space right here. This place making project, of course, is a pizza oven. That's a good way to make friends is having a pizza oven, especially if you got some pizza in there cooking. So City Repair encourages, has, has workshops and events in Portland to teach people about placemaking and to make installations to actually get people out there and do the work of creating these places in the neighborhoods that cause people more to bond with their neighborhood. Placemaking says there are people who care about this neighborhood. It's community building. It's uh, the action uh, and the assets and uh, the, the whole idea of placemaking is to build community, build cohesion, build solidarity in the neighborhood. And again, city repair is, uh, you can find that online, lots of pictures. So, and, and this idea of placemaking doesn't originate with city repair, but they've definitely taken it to a high level. And there are lots of cities and towns around the country who are making use of what they've learned from city repair. It's great. Most of us know about Neighborhood Watch. It usually includes this kind of sinister looking logo right here. It's pretty mainstream in Eugene, the city's police department administers this program. It's about property protection and, and that's fine. Uh, property needs to be protected, of course. And the whole idea is have eyes out on the street and report something that doesn't look right and all that's fine. What if city uh, neighborhood watch, what if neighborhood watch encouraged people to build front yard gardens? What if neighborhood watch became a conduit of permaculture and front yard gardens and neighborhood resiliency? If you've got a garden out front along the street like this right here, this is the street. This is one of our bike tours right here. If you're out here in your garden, well, you've got a pretty good view of the street. If I lived on this street, I'd be glad to have these people with a front yard garden because you can see what's happening on the street. This increases the security of the entire street, not to mention it looks nice and uh, it helps enhance neighborhood food security as well. I've talked with the neighborhood watch people in Eugene many times explaining this and, and they say, well, that's a nice idea and it hasn't really gone anywhere. Uh, anybody who's uh, listening to this presentation can certainly go to your city because you probably have neighborhood watch or something like this and approach them with the idea too. Maybe you'll have better luck. But this is a, a wonderful asset with multiple benefits that could uh, all kinds of uh, uh, enhancements to the street and the neighborhood with the food and uh, the security. And of course, if you have a front yard garden yourself, you know it's a great way to meet people. You make lots of friends being out here looking after the artichokes and uh, the winter squash. So uh, Neighborhood Watch can be turned into a, a much more robust kind of a, of a community service. You can tell I'm very much into urban land use. And this picture here is from Barcelona, Spain. I was gonna go to Barcelona this summer, but uh, I didn't because of the virus. I wanted to see all this stuff firsthand because this is one of the best stories I know of reclaiming automobile space and repurposing it for people. The short story is this is a super block right here. These are like nine blocks. These aren't blocks like what we're used to. These are, these are big time blocks right here. Each one of these blocks probably has 10 or 15,000 people living in one of these blocks. But the short story is to limit the amount of traffic that can be on the inside of the block. This is only local traffic. This blue is only local traffic. The yellow 
is crosstown traffic. If you want to go from way over here to way over here, you can go on this street here. But in here, it's only local traffic, and you can only go like five miles an hour. So what that means is the cars are all slowed down. It reduces the need for having cars. It creates the opportunity to take a space. This was an intersection. This place right here, there could have been, this is a street, this is a street, and another. This would have been just full of cars honking and exhaust. It's a playground now. So this is the beginning, the early going of Barcelona's super blocks. But there are other parts of the program too. They're better managing uh, buses and their metro than they, uh, so it's a holistic approach. And there has to be neighborhood buy-in. Uh, not everybody wants to see this happen, but you can look at this community building, repurposing automobile space for community space. This builds uh, culture, this builds solidarity. So once again, a city street is an asset with a lot of potential and Barcelona and an increasing number of other cities all over the world are, are doing their own version of this kind of reclaiming city space, uh, public space for, uh, for bikes, for pedestrians, for kids. So this is a great story. I'll say a little more about that when we do the presentation, uh, pushing back on cars. Columbia Eco Village in Portland. This is a retrofit uh, uh, eco village. And there was an apartment complex. This is part of the apartment complex. This is taken from the street. This is the apartment complex. It was just a regular mainstream apartment complex. But people had the idea to buy the apartment complex, upgrade it, put in edible landscaping, and create a, a, a retrofit co-housing. That's what this is. It's not a, a specifically built co-housing, it's a retrofit co-housing. And of course, that means lots of amenities because people are sharing stuff. It's a great way to reduce the eco footprint. Uh, I don't have a personal experience with co-housing. I know it can cost a fair amount of money to buy into a co-housing. If you can afford it, it's great. But that still means that it's reducing the eco footprint. But taking uh, a sort of run down uh, apartment complex, and you can see these nice amenities, little library out front, a bench. This is kind of placemaking right here, actually. These are placemaking features. But it's a wonderful place to live for the people who are there. This picture from my neighborhood, we have a rec center. We have a recreation center in my neighborhood. It's a few blocks away. And that's an enormous community resource. That's an asset. That's a huge asset to our neighborhood because the rec center has facilities that just happen to be able to host a suburban permaculture convergence. We had the 2015 Northwest Permaculture Convergence here in our neighborhood. And we had bike rides, we had uh, interior inside uh, presentations and plenary sessions and different kinds of uh, breakout groups. This is one of the bike tours here to see uh, some of the different sites in our neighborhood. We figure that both the part of it that, that you had to pay to go to, and a lot of it was free also. This expo, this was all free right here. We figure seven or 800 people participated in one way or another. And this, of course, we want to get the idea of permaculture and uh, living uh, eco-friendly community building. We want to get this out to the wider audience. So we had the asset, we had the allies here in the neighborhood because this took a lot of people to help put on this event, and most of them were from the neighborhood here. So we brought a lot of people together, allies, assets, and actions here in our neighborhood to put on a suburban permaculture convergence. 
Here's an interesting picture. Joshua will recognize this because Joshua kind of did the, the, the graphics work on this. This is a, a street, uh, a little strip mall on the street. This is a few blocks from where I live. Doesn't look very glamorous, does it? Actually, there's a really nice bike shop back here, but this is not the ultimate use of this space. Some people might agree with doing this, some people might not. But imagine if in this parking lot area, there was an upgrade in the development. And just imagine if these were shops that served the neighborhood, that uh, helped people take care of their needs without having to get into a car to go drive somewhere and say that these were cooperative living. Some of these businesses might be co-ops. That's all very kind of a nice imagination right there. But there are tens and tens, if not hundreds of thousands of places around the country that look something like that, that, um, that could be upgraded, that could serve the community better in a positive way. This is kind of a for fun picture. This doesn't really fit so much into the sustainability realm, but I really like the High Line in Manhattan. The High Line was a, uh, started out as an elevated railway that eventually became abandoned in the 1980s. And at just uh, 20, 25 feet up above the ground, it was just kind of overgrown. This is 25 feet above the ground right here and it's all overgrown. Uh, the city had the idea, well, we just, it's a hazard. We need to take this thing down. And of course, when somebody starts to take something away, that motivates people to want to save that asset. So there became a nonprofit in this part of New York City to, I think it's near Greenwich Village. I'm not sure the exact um, this is Hudson Yards right, right here also, if you're aware, if you're familiar with New York City. This is Hudson Yards about five years ago. But there became a movement to save the rail line and turn it into an elevated park. And this is essentially what it looks like now. You're 20, 25 feet up above the ground. You have these awesome views. It's been landscaped. There's restaurants up here. So not every city has, a, has a, an asset like this, but New York City did pretty well, you know, to save the, the, the rail line and turn it into a high line. Uh, and have to uh, add also, it's uh, catalyzed a lot of gentrification in the neighborhood because a lot of people want to live here because it's just such a great feature. But apart from that, it's really nice to walk up here. And, and, and if you're into architecture, it's, it's one of my favorite places in New York City. This is a maybe hopeful asset that, that turns into something even better uh, at some point. If you're acquainted with some of Joe Biden's uh, platform, for his running for the presidency. Uh, he has some support for climate change. Um, mainstream uh, Joe Biden, um, certainly uh, better than, than the alternative. But one of his programs that he would like to, to start if he became president would be something of a climate core. And that would be a public service. You know, there's already a government program called AmeriCorps, and that's for younger people. And they work for a year or two, uh, learn skills, uh, help with projects in the community. That one picture we saw of Friendly Garden when they were first breaking ground, AmeriCorps was there. And there were about 12 or 14 AmeriCorps people to help with the work. So Joe Biden's idea would potentially greatly increase the size of AmeriCorps. And as history moves along and it becomes more apparent that we need to be more urgent as a society in repurposing a lot of what we built, as in 
the block planning and uh, the, uh, the community plazas, these types of projects to make our cities more habitable, to make them more livable, that could become a part of the agenda of Joe Biden's Climate Corps. Uh, there could be both the actions of repairing the urban landscape, but also there'd be education that would go along with that. Of course, in my sort of optimistic thinking, these kids, these young people are going to learn permaculture and they're going to have some instructors who are going to get some really good information about a uh, paradigm shift if it's not already happening by then. But I see this as kind of a, of a potential that could evolve uh, as time goes on into a more robust, a, a more ambitious kind of a service program to the community with a bigger agenda than even what Joe Biden might be thinking about. And these are just some, some AmeriCorps people that I uh, lifted off of the internet. Just imagine, it's all doing great stuff. It, it makes me feel good just looking at that. So what I think I'm gonna do is just say enough pictures. Um, we've seen some really, really good pictures. Here's one more. This is my next door neighbor. This was a driveway right here. He had his gravel driveway dug out and had it turned into a garden. That's next door to me. I like that. So what are the benefits for doing this work? All kinds of benefits. If you can do a screen share, you're welcome to take a picture of this. But the benefits are just everything all of us here would like to see with uh, the environment, uh, social, political, economic, personal benefits of all sides, of all sizes and kinds. If we uh, put allies, assets, and actions together uh, even more so than right now. So I want to do just a quick review of what we're coming up with in future. Uh, two weeks from now, presentations are about every other week. And this is uh, a picture from the first presentation, just uh, mentioning that the first presentation is on YouTube. Each one of these presentations is going to end up on YouTube. So the first one already is. The third presentation, the next one after, after this one, is One Earth Lifestyles. What might a lifestyle look like that, as we discussed earlier, that everybody on planet Earth could have something of a lifestyle, that, uh, that planet Earth could provide the resources and also process the, uh, the waste that humans create. That's going to be October 8th, One Earth Lifestyle. And then October 22nd, a critique of market capitalism. After you see this presentation, you'll probably never think of uh, our economic system the same way again, because I, I have a lot to say about market capitalism, about economics as we know it. There are so many mythologies that need to be uh, addressed uh, as, as in efficiency. Is this an efficient economic system? I would not say so. The social engineering, the idea of American exceptionalism, the fraud of the marketplace. So that's what we're going to look at October 22nd. This could be extremely empowering. I'm sure other people have some of these same thoughts, but when we, we all have conversations with people who might not be quite the same, seeing the world exactly like we do, and that's okay, but when we have conversations and try to explain to people, life could be different. We could have a positive uh, economy. We could have an economy that serves the goals of a healthy society. Would that look really different. That would look way different. So uh, lifestyles, of course, 
the social, political, economic disequity, the commercial media, climate change, all of these are intimately related to our economy. So that's going to be a great, uh, a great presentation there. And then this I've mentioned November 5th, pushing back against cars. Uh, we'll take a look at some places in the United States that are pushing back on cars. Lots of cities are actually, lots of places, uh, especially with the, the COVID-19 are turning more streets into more friendly, fewer cars. Um, there are freeway fights. I'd like to mention places where there, there could have been a freeway, that there's a park there now, such as the Southwest Corridor in Boston, or where there actually was a divided highway like this in Portland that you can see here, I put a little car in there, that used to be wonderful prime real estate along the river. And of course, that's where they put a highway, but that highway is not there anymore. Market Street in San Francisco is now closed to private cars. Uh, I mentioned also the plazas in New York City. And then of course, there's super blocks in Barcelona and uh, other types of urban design in Holland and uh, Denmark, other places in Europe that are pushing back against cars. This is really inspiring. This is one of my favorite topics. And then November 18th, this presentation be a little similar to this. I'd probably go into more explanation about someplace like East Blair Housing Co-op. I wouldn't be showing so many pictures. I'd be going deeper into preview of a preferred future. So that's uh, November 18th. There are a fair number of people and perhaps uh, some people watching this evening who in a sense are already living in that future. And it's really important that we share the examples we have of what the future can look like. It's important we share those examples with the community. That kind of goes along uh, with this particular system change, December 3rd. I would call this a primer for paradigm shift. And that may sound a little ambitious, uh, but what I want to do is share thoughts I have about how we could actually move this whole project further along and would welcome anybody else to run with these ideas, share their ideas, build on this. Uh, the idea of paradigm shift doesn't need, doesn't mean we have to have 100 people to get started. People can get started in their own lives by themselves with no permission needed from anybody. That's the base of the paradigm shift pyramid. And that's what I'd like to talk about. How can we go from the base of the pyramid? Uh, organizations become more uh, synchronized with each other because, as I mentioned, essentially we're on the same team. And if we realize that, there's lots that can be done to move the whole idea forward of a, of a sustainable society, of a responsible economy, healthy people in a restored natural environment. Those, of course, are the ideals. Um, is that ambitious? Of course it is. But what, what is there better to do than the effort to, to take something that, that isn't working very well and repair it and make it better? What else is there to do? So, so that's, that is what I have. Uh, once again, this is the schedule for the remaining presentations. And at this point, I am going to see about exiting the, uh, the screen here. Right, let's see. Joshua, you can turn off the recording if you would.